All right, welcome back uh, to our virtual Sunday School Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're going to be changing gears. We're going to be going into the book of Psalms here for the next uh, month or so. So for July and August, we're going to be uh, moving into the book of Psalms. Um, we're not going to cover every chapter. Um, we're going to be moving, you know, sporadically throughout it. But this lesson is on Psalm 1, Psalm chapter 1. And the title of this lesson is Look to the Lord and the Fruit of Righteousness in Living. So right off the bat, remember last week, we looked at the importance of God's Word in the life of a believer. This week, we will look at the importance of a life lived for God, a life that is Spirit-led, a life that is Spirit-led. So a couple of questions to ask you before we get started. Um, you can think about these questions, go in and comment if you want to, but as you're turning to the book of Psalm chapter 1, how do certain key decisions set our life on a godly course? There are certain decisions out there that you've made that has set your life on a godly course. Was it the way you were raised? Was it something that happened in church? Maybe something that happened at a youth camp? Maybe something that's happened in your marriage? Um, some decisions that you've made has set your life on a godly course. Maybe it's you've witnessed to somebody, somebody's witnessed to you. Also, how might a person avoid trouble by following a godly way sooner or more consistently? How does a person avoid trouble by following a godly way sooner or more consistently? So we're going to jump right into God's word. Feel free to comment on those questions there if you feel like it. Um, but we're going to jump into Psalm chapter 1. And our first part is going to be Psalm 1 verses 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in a way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. You see, sometimes Scripture gives us instructions on what not to do. Notice in this passage, those who desire to be blessed are called to avoid walking, avoid sitting, and or avoid sitting with sinners, mockers, and the wicked. So what does it take to walk in step? What does it take to walk in step with someone? And when I read this question, I found this picture. Some of you may have seen this. You can Google it. You can find it. I know I've seen this before in the past. And some of you may have different pictures of footsteps in the sand. But when someone is walking in footsteps with someone, a person looks at the other, adjusts the way they're walking to match his or her pace and steps. Notice this is an intentional process. You're intentionally doing it. Parents, dads, moms, they've walked on the beach. Now, obviously, the dad's feet are going to be bigger. So the child is going to try to walk in the footsteps of the parent. Do you walk in the footsteps of Jesus? What way do sinners tend to take? And what might it mean for us to stand in that way as well? Notice again that this requires an act of will. Those of us that follow Jesus, we walk in his footsteps on purpose, intentional. Those that choose not to follow Jesus, again, it's intentional. They choose not to. 
they choose not to. And see, then the psalm shifts to guiding us to what to do. Delight in and meditate on the law of the Lord. The result of such living is health and fruitfulness. Remember, God speaks his word to his people. So what might it mean for us to delight in God's law? What might it mean for us to delight in God's word? Remember last week I said, how many of you getting fired up going to church? How many of you get excited about going and listening to God's word? And again, I use this analogy all the time. Going to church recharges my spiritual batteries. I look forward to listening to the sermon. I look forward to listening to the songs of praise. Again, we, we give God an hour, two at the most, when Sunday school's in. Um, when, we were back to, when we get back to normal, we're having Sunday school and kid stuff and morning worship and fellowship. You know, we're in church two, maybe three hours, depending on if we're there early for practice and if we hang out and fellowship for a few minutes, you know, two, three hours at a max. But getting excited about God's word. So again, what does it mean for us to delight in God's law? What does it mean for us to get delight in God's word? Does it give you meaning? Is it hard for you to understand? Is it easier for you to understand? See, God speaks to us in ways that we don't understand. He gives us rules. He gives us laws. He gives us his word. And he expects us to walk in the footsteps. Our church has been, uh, every day, we've been going through the book of Psalms as a daily devotion. And those of you that tune in, some of you have read, you know, parts of the proverb. And you talk about it and explain it. The Proverbs is a really good book to follow in the footsteps. And here again in the book of Psalm, we're asked to follow in the footsteps. And again, if you go back, remember, what does it say? He's not telling us what to do. He's telling us what not to do. Do not walk in the footsteps of the wicked. Do not stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of of mockers. What happens when we sit in the company of mockers? We're entertaining them. What happens when we follow those that are wicked? There's an analogy out there. Is it garbage in, garbage out? If you bring in bad stuff, you're going to put out bad stuff. If you're used to cussing like a sailor on a Saturday night, you're taking garbage in and you're putting garbage out. But if you're in God's Word and you're reading it and you're meditating on it and you're delighted to be in it, the good stuff that comes in is the good stuff that's going to come out. So here's the next question. What would it be like to live like a tree planted to streams of living water? You see, a tree needs what? It needs sunlight. It needs water. It needs nourishment. Uh, they, they pollinate. Flowers pollinate. Plants pollinate. Some of you out there that have gardens, um, you know, things have to, you have to have sunlight. It, you just can't have just daylight and that's it. Your crops won't, won't work and they won't grow. A tree without water will die. So why are we looking at a tree beside living water? You see, God is our living water. We go thirsty when we don't have him we should be thirsting for god more we want to be a tree we want to be a tall strong tree to honor god and to do that we have to be the living we have we have to want his living water how can you expect to grow if you don't work on something i'll give you an example and again, kids are going to be going back to school pretty soon, depending on what state, what county you're in. But see, over the summer, the retention rate will go down. And I'm going to use math class as an example. There's some kids have just finished up with, say, like Algebra 1. They learn these formulas and stuff. So now when school goes back two to three months later, 
the teacher has to start over with the review. Let's look and see what you remember. And then they go off of that. And then they start building on it and building on it and building on it. And then at the end of the year, they have to take a test on everything they've learned. And the kids have to retain this. And again, I've told my, you know, my class, uh, my basketball team, I've told them all this. I said, here's the thing. If you go to class, and again, at West Florida High School, classes are 90 minutes long. And we see them every other day. But if you break it up, for average of 45 minutes a day. A teacher can only teach you but so much in 90 minutes. And we're on every other day, so sometimes we only see them twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So how much can a kid learn in 90 minutes in class? And I said, why do you, teach a te why do you think a teacher gives you homework? Because they want you to practice outside of class. It's not that they're trying to be mean. They want you to practice outside of class. When I'm coaching my basketball team, I told them, I said, I've only got you for two or three hours a day. And in summer ball, we're only doing Mondays and Wednesdays. And I've got them for three hours a day. There's only so much I can teach them with the drills, uh, the dribbling, the offense, the defense, everything that we do. There's only so much I can teach you. When you leave the gym and you go home, you don't grab a slice of pizza and sit down and be lazy until the next practice. You need to practice on your own. That's how you get better. That's how you get better. And in God's word, we are only go to church an hour or two on Wednesday night Bible study. This is about 30, 35, 40 minutes. And that's it. What do you do when you practice outside of church? Remember last week I suggested at the end of the lesson, Tog, your time alone with God. What's your tog time like? What do you practice outside of church? Now, I can tell you right now, those of you that think I can go to church and get into heaven, you need to think again because it's your relationship with God. Yes, going to church is great. We need that. I need to recharge my spiritual batteries. But are you reading in the Word? Are you having your Bible devotion, your, your devotions? Are you reading the Bible? Are you praying? Are you talking with Him? Are you walking with Him? If not, you're that tree that doesn't have any water. If you are doing your daily devotions and you're reading your Bible and you talk with Him and you walk with Him and He lives with you every day, then you're that tree and you're planted by a stream of living water. Now we're going to move on to the next part. Psalm chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. Not so the wicked, they're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of righteousness. Having just described the godly person in terms of a well-rooted tree able to stand strong and yield fruit, the psalm describes sinners in terms of the chaff blown away by a stiff breeze. They have no root, no source of life, and no ability to stand. Now, feel free to comment and interpret this how you want but the chaff that needs to be blown away there, there's it has no root to be there's no root it has no stability it's just blown away how stable is your life today with God or you're just gonna just get bounced around and knocked around all you want so how does the figure of speech of chaff describe the state and the fate of the wicked? How does this describe the state of the fate and the wicked? Are you firm? Are you strong with the Lord? Or are you weak and you're going to get blown away? How, how, how strong is your faith? What would it be like to be blown about like chaff? 
this would be a good time to go in and compliment or not compliment but to comment to comment about this because i tell you my mind is racing in so many different ways about this question i'm just i'm at all about the question what's your interpretation of this what is your interpretation of the chaff when it comes to the state and the fate of the wicked are you strong at the Lord or are you going to get blown away because I'm telling you those out there that don't know the Lord they're weak I'm strong with the Lord spiritually I do not want to get blown away by somebody else I have to be firm and I guess the way I look at it is what if somebody comes up and questions you about God what if somebody comes up and questions you about your faith they question you about your church about your belief are you gonna be able to stand strong and firm about your church about your faith about your religion and talk to them about Jesus and how he died on the cross for your sins or you're gonna stand there and let them just barrel over you now some are out there that are attacking Christianity I feel for them, and we should be praying for those because those that don't know the Lord they're gonna get blown around because they're not firm with the Lord imagine for a minute the hopelessness of such a life what might it be like to be blown about like chaff so if you could imagine just for a minute the hopelessness of such a life chaff has no hope none whatsoever we were kids we used to pick up the dandelions and uh, we used to blow them around and watch them float around those dandelions they just they float they're gone they're blown away now yeah they're gonna pollinate out there and do what they need to do with nature but again chaff is being blown away it has no boundary it has has no no foundation none whatsoever so the hopelessness of a life that has no foundation no firm foundation what's it going to be like what might someone's life look like if they faced challenges with no grounding and no root what kind of living according to this psalm sets a person on such a path you know, I, I start thinking about trees and plants and gardens. And there's a lot of you out there that have gardens. And you're planting your corn and your tomatoes, um, your cucumbers, your squash, whatever, whatever you're planting. When you go out there and you tend to your garden, what do you do? You water it. You pick up the weeds. You might have to go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy something to spray so that it'll kill the bugs, it'll kill the algae. Um, you, you tend to those things because those things are rooted in the ground. But if we don't nourish those plants, those crops, corn has roots, tomatoes have roots. All those things that you plant, they have roots in the ground. Some are stronger than others, but they have to be watered. They have to be nourished. They have to be fed. And when they blossom, they came out nice and ripe. But imagine those of you that are farmers and you don't tend to that. Your crops are going to go bad. The same thing is with your spiritual life. Are you feeding yourself? Look at yourself as corn stalk maybe you want to look at yourself as a tomato so maybe you there like tomatoes pick a vegetable okay you're being grown as that vegetable you want to be fed but your master doesn't come out and feed you it's a hopeless life and eventually you're gonna get you're gonna die and wither away and you're gonna be blown away like chaff but if we're in God's Word and we study God's Word, our roots, our spiritual roots are going to be stronger 
than what they were before. What is the ultimate fate of the wicked? Good time to go in and comment. I mean, really, that question is self-explanatory. What's the fate of the, of the wicked? It's really hard to get into heaven if you don't know God. Could you imagine going and knocking on a neighbor's door? And you ask to come inside. They don't know you. You don't know them. Do you think they're going to ask you to come inside? Now, imagine going to a friend's house, a relative's house, mom and dad's house, knocking on the door. Hey, good to see you. Come on in. That's the way I feel when it's time to go to heaven. It's time for me to go knock on heaven's gate. And Jesus knows me, and I know him. And he's going to say, come on inside. Now, I'm not judging anybody, but for those of the wicked, those that don't follow Jesus intentionally, and they go to knock on his door, Jesus may or may not accept them into heaven. And I, I think about that way. It's like, I want to be accepted in there because he knows me, and I know him. The last part of our lesson, verse 6, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The path we choose leads to a destination, and if we keep on the path, we will eventually get there. The way of the righteous leads towards the Lord, and the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So, here's a question for you. Is it not the purpose of a highway to reach a destination? What does it mean for our lives to be on one way or another? Some of you that go on a trip, all right, you either you do your research, you might go on Google Maps. Um, some of you might still use a hard copy of a map. Some of you use a GPS. So let's say, for example, GPS or Google Maps, you plug in the destination. That your hoping and banking that that GPS or your phone is going to get you there. Normally it's right. But you never sometimes you ever wonders like I know where I'm going and I'm not sure if this thing is right. I think I can get there quicker this way. And yet your GPS is telling you to go this way and you can get there quicker this way. What do you do? Do you trust your GPS? Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. But then I think about it when Jesus gives us directions. What direction does he want you to go in? Are you going to trust the directions that he gives you? Or are you going to veer off on your own path? Now I can tell you from experience being raised in a pastor's home, when a pastor gets the calling to go and shepherd a church, they don't question it. We've moved several several different times. And packing up and moving, it's not easy. Lorraine and I, being in the Marine Corps, every three years you pack up and move. You get your orders, you got to move. No questions asked. When God calls you to do something, do you question it? When he tells you, I needed you to go here and here and here. Do you question it? Being a teacher, we were at Jacksonville, North Carolina, and I was teaching at Richlands High School. And at the time, Lorena was deployed in Iraq. And as she was deployed, halfway through the school year, she said, hey, when I get back from Iraq, guess where we're going? I've got orders to Pensacola, Florida. Well, at the time, I was teaching high school. I was dead in it. I was uh, teaching at the uh, Sunday school class at our church. I think I was Sunday school superintendent there for a little bit. Uh, I was an appraised man there. And everything seemed to be going good. And she said, yep, we're going to Pensacola. And I was like, 
But I just started doing this and this. She's like, well, I got to go. You can stay there if you want to, but I got to go because I got orders. Back then, it was hard for me to go, this is going to be tough. You know, right when I thought everything was going great, we got to pack up and move. God calls us to do that sometimes. Pack up and move. What do you want me to do, Lord? Pack up and move. When he calls you to a destination, do you question it? Are you going to go on that right path to that destination that he wants you on? Or are you going to veer off and do your own thing? Some of us do that. Some of us veer off and do our own thing. How might it encourage us to know the Lord watches our way and guides us along the way? How encouraging is it for us knowing that Lord says, I want you to do this. Okay, yes, sir. Boom, and we're off and doing it. And not only is he guiding us, but he's encouraging us along the way. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome right there. So let me read this to you real quick. Our world is filled with many different ways of living, many paths to choose, and many routes to take. The godly life is a way of living a path made up of thousands of choices that add up to a life lived in response to the word, headed for an amazing destination in the presence of God. Yet, the wicked life is also a way, a sum of choices lived by rejecting God in our daily lives. Occasionally, we are reminded, sometimes shockingly, the day in, day out choices we make are really life and death choices and have been all along. Question for you. Do you think everyone can be put into one of two categories today? Those who walk in the way of righteous and those who walk in the way of wicked. Do you think there's only two categories? This would be a good time to go in and throw in a comment. Is there another choice? The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked? Is there any other choice? As I read this lesson, I was like, I don't think I can think of another choice. Those that follow God and those that don't. I don't think there's an in-between. You see, sometimes a lot of people out there want to straddle the fence. They're not quite sure which way they want to go. Are you straddling the fence? Or are you firm on one side or firm on the other? If you're on the wrong side of the fence, you might want to find a way over the fence or around it. Because the fence that God is on, the side of the fence that God's on, that's the side you need to be on. So those of you that are tittering, that, uh, titter-tottering on the top of that fence, you might want to make up your mind. What makes a person righteous? And what makes a person wicked? And it's funny because I can read a lot of stuff. You could read a lot of stuff. And I actually looked this up. Being righteous literally means to be right. Especially in a moral way. See, religious people often talk about being righteous. In their view, the righteous person not only does the right thing for other people, but also follows the laws of their religion. Did you get that last part there? A righteous person not only does the right thing for other people, but also follows the laws of their religion. Are you following the laws of God today? If you're not, then you're in a way of the wicked. In what ways can a person choose and stay on the path of the righteous living? You're on a path. And there's certain exits, side paths, side roads that you can take. You know, it's funny that the older I get, the easier distracted I am. And as I'm driving down the road, you see these billboards, you see these signs, you see the marquees of uh, restaurants and stuff. 
And my mind wonders. Does your mind wonder when you're following God? You know, are, are we veering off the path too much? Hey, that looks pretty exciting. Let me go over here. Is that the right path that God wants you on? Hey, check that out. Let's stop here. And Is that the right path that we need to be on? It's not like you say, God, let me hit the pause button for a minute and let me go do something weak, and then I'll come back and I'll get right back on the right path. That's not how it works. That's that's not how it works. Okay? It, it's not. You see, surrender your life to God and live daily in obedience to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you get that? Surrender. Surrender your life to God and live daily in obedience. Daily in obedience. Are you obeying God's law? Daily in obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. So how's your obedience? Are you righteous? Are you quarter righteous? Are you half? Why aren't you 100% righteous? If you're not 100% righteous, I'm sorry to tell you, but there's a percentage of you that's probably wicked. Remember that fence I said we're teetering on? Well, I'm 75% righteous, but I'm only 25% the other way. That's not how it works, folks. I'm sorry to tell you, that's not how it works. Are you obeying God's command 100%? So, finish off. Let me ask you this. What path are you on today? Are you on the right path today? In what ways can a person choose to stay on the path of the living? How do Bible study, prayer, worship, and service to others play a major role and an indispensable part in the following of a righteous path? Some of you out there are true to your Bible study. Some of you out there that are true to prayer. Some of you pray long. Some of you pray short. Um, some of you fast. Some of you pray. Some of you pray fast. That was something my dad used to always say, and if you didn't quite catch it, um, some people pray, some people fast, and some people pray fast, especially at a meal time. So there's your there's your uh, dad joke. What about your worship, and in your service to others? You see, what's inside, God only sees. That's it. So when God examines you. I don't know why, but the Lord just told me something about an x-ray. Let's lay you down on the x-ray table and let the Lord x-ray what's inside of you. Is it 100% righteous? Is it 75% righteous and 25%? Uh, I don't like what he's got in there. God sees your heart. And there's some stuff inside that you probably need to get rid of. Something's going to eat at you that's wicked. And then you need to get rid of it. So when God x-rays you and he looks inside and he sees your spirit in your heart, what does he see? Does he see a person that's praying all the time? Does he see a person that trusts and walks in his way, in his path? And they avoid those that are wicked? So what path are you on today? Are you on the right path or are you on the wrong path? What activities should you avoid if you desire to be righteous? What activities would God have you embrace? There are some activities out there that you probably need to give up. There's some of you out there that probably need activities that God will take and embrace. And I can tell you, since the technology came around, the cell phone, the tablets, 
the iPads and all those those activities there's some stuff on there you probably should be avoiding and I know it's good for us to relax and have entertainment and watch TV and play games and stuff it's good for us but is all that stuff on there consuming more time than what you should be given to God is it consuming more of your life and less of God so what activities should you avoid to be more of a righteous person and lastly what priorities need to be changed if you desire to be righteous what priorities would God have you embrace where's your priorities today is your priorities with God or your priorities with what you want there's a difference between a need and a want it's what God needs and what you want or what God wants you to do what path are you following today what priorities need to be changed if you desire to be righteous what priorities would God have you embrace where's your priorities today there's some things that you might want to get rid of what path are you on today are you on the right path are you on the righteous path or are you on the wicked path most of you out there are listening you're going yeah I got it I know my right path I know what God wants me to do but there's some people out there that you know that you might need to pray for uh, some people that might be watching this for the first time you know sometimes the truth hurts but the guilt trip might come in and yeah I, I know deep down inside I shouldn't be doing certain things yeah maybe I should change maybe I should and I'll pray for you that whatever God wants you to do that's the right path that you need to be on don't get concentrated on veering off here and there you stay on the right path that God wants you to be on let's close with prayer our Heavenly Father thank you for this lesson thank you for the book of Psalm thank you for uh, giving us a good lesson tonight about staying on the right path, about being a righteous person. Lord, help us to avoid those that are wicked, those that uh, are mockers. Lord, uh, help us in everything that we do. Again, thank you for the services, for our pastors uh, that have preached and prepared, the song leaders, uh, those that are playing instruments, all those churches. Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for uh, those that are in charge. Lord, watch over each and every one of us. Keep us all in the center of your will. And we love you and praise you everything that we do. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So normally, at before Sunday school starts, we'd always throw in prayer, prayer requests. But kind of changed it up here a little bit. And if you've got any prayer requests, by all means, throw them in there. Um, but just load them up with prayer requests and praises so that we can pray for them throughout the day. And those of us that go in and, and make a comment, uh, we can follow up and we can pray for those throughout the week. So next week, we'll, we're still going to be in the book of Psalm, but we'll be in Psalm chapter 15. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the lesson, and we'll see you next time.